Welcome to the first Internet Book Show. Join me for the next half hour with Naomi Wood, Karen Swan and Louise John Cox in Book Break. Hello and welcome. I'm Alex Hemmingsley and this is Book Break. Today is the first of 10 monthly episodes where I will be joined by some of the world's biggest authors to celebrate all things books related. So, for the next half an hour or so, grab a sandwich, put up your feet and relax as we take a wander through the literary world. Today, I am joined by Naomi Wood, the author of The Godless Boys, and the soon to be released Mrs Hemingway, author of Christmas at Claridge's, Karen Swan, and last but not least, for all your Friday afternoon sugar cravings, food journalist and author Louise John Cox is going to talk to us about all things culinary, especially gay. Also coming up on today's show, his novels are dark and full of murder and intrigue. Crime writer Peter James takes us on a tour of his writing room. We'll separate the wheat from the chaff and reveal the hottest books to buy this year. And one author will face our quick fire questions. Ladies. <laughs> Welcome. So, Naomi, you're here to talk about Mrs. Hemingway, but you've already, your debut's already been published, so how was it getting back in the saddle after first, first literary book? Uh, it actually wasn't too difficult because I was facing a rather tight turnaround, shall we say? Oh, there was a yeah. deadline looming. Uh, so I actually finished uh, The Godless Boys, the first book, mm -hmm. on the Friday, mm -hmm. had a weekend off, and then started, <laughs> on, <laughs> started on the Monday. So I had to get back into it really quickly. Yeah. Needless to say, that has not happened this time around. I finished right, right. Uh, Mrs. Hemingway in November and haven't written a thing yeah, since. Yeah, you've had a nice little <laughs> I've had a lovely holiday break. So, uh, yes, getting back into it was uh, fine, but I haven't yeah, started well, the third yet. <laughs> no, I didn't. I was still very firmly on the horse. <laughs> um, but, th but they were completely different kinds of books because The Godless Boys is quite sort of fantastical and sort mm -hmm. of dystopian universe. Mm -hmm. And this Mrs. Hemingway, you, know, you had to read a lot of biographies first yes. and get all your facts lined up before yeah. you started messing with them. So uh, did was... you like sort of panic at having to do something completely different? Well, I think that there are completely different projects. As you say, The Godless Boys is a kind of dystopia and Mrs. Hemingway is based on all this research about Hemingway's four wives. Um, but the two endeavours are essentially the same thing because yeah. you're still world building. You're still yeah. trying to sort of ask the reader to you know, feel like they're in Key West or Cuba mm. or Paris or all these places that I had to go to yeah. for research, which is a massive Tough. chore. Um, but um, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't, I didn't find it too much of a different yeah. uh, endeavour, although... It, just that you could have done, that That was why you kept going to Cuba and yeah, all no, of that. It was, <laughs> you didn't have enough it, of a break. It was really two. nice. Yeah, my accountant kept on looking at my receipts and going, really? <laughs> <laughs> Cuba, Key West. Um, so, but it was different because yeah. there was a huge amount of research I had mm. to do, which took, you know, this full span of three years. Yeah. And, uh, you know, with The Godless Boys, it was an imagined yeah. world and... Um, uh, I could do what I liked, whereas a lot of the time I was writing sort of research books open in the British yeah. Library and yeah. sort of referring to things here and there. So there was so much more research to yeah. do. It's just a different, um, you know, kind of business writing historical fiction, yeah. trying to keep a lot of the facts, you know, straight. So. And Karen, you have... You had Christmas at Claridge's only a couple of months ago. You've got yes. another one coming up. Yes. So, I mean, I fear the bar's been set quite high <laughs> <in the UK, laughs> for industry. Um, but do, how do you kind of keep disciplined? You're kind of on sort of quite a schedule and, you, you know, you, yeah. you've, got, you've got the deadline kind of built into your yes. titles now. Yes, so yes, I do. How do, you, do you have schedules as I such? have to. You know, you have to treat it as a job you know it is a I'm working every day yeah um and very often weekends I don't work in the evenings actually because I'm too exhausted but you know yeah I, I do work very often seven days a week mm. and that's fine because actually when I'm having a good day at work it's an absolute breeze and it doesn't feel like work at all yeah. obviously on those bad days when you can barely get 50 words down you just yeah. think, oh and you're <laughs> very aware then of your word count and oh my god I'm mm -hmm. gonna fall behind but um you know it is a job and 
I, I like the fact that I can, you know, I get readers emailing me December, January, Feb, having mm -hmm. read the Christmas book, saying, well, when's the next one? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'd say, uh. oh, it's kind of November. <laughs> and you could, you could almost hear this sigh over the interweb, you know, oh, God. Yeah. And so now I say, well, it's, it's in May, actually. You know, and you can have it for your summer holidays. And and I like the fact that I can deliver that. And yeah. uh, that's, what I, that's what I'm doing it for now. Yeah. 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 And Louise, your, yours was a completely different process. Mm. You're, you're completely based in fact and history because it mm. is your history. So how did that kind of come about for you, sort of writing a baking and family history together? My, my family had run and owned their own tea shop for over 42 years. And yeah. whenever I wrote about cakes, everyone seemed to like it, so I carried on. <laughs> <laughs> and where, where were you <clears throat> writing about cakes? It was... um, I started off as a PhD right. at Bath Spa University. <gasps> Which sounds That's like a very odd very PhD. PhD. <laughs> <laughs> very academic. Um, and then, obviously, as I started to write about the cakes, mm -hmm. I realised I actually needed to bake them as well. But I'm not yeah. a chef. I'm not We're a trained back to chef. <laughs> Miami over here. Yeah. Right? yeah. <laughs> of course. I'll be known as that happily. <laughs> <laughs> so one day, my father said, "I think it's time you got your hands messy and come into the kitchen and." Together, he he taught me how to, to bake the recipes oh, from the tea oh, yeah. shop. And then as we baked, he actually told me stories. Mm -hmm. And so the whole tea so shop it, came back alive again for that, me. Yeah. The sights oh. and the scents and the tastes of the cakes. Yeah. And so we've got Mrs. Hemingway here, but there isn't a Mrs. Hemingway. No. <laughs> There's four. They kept, Trick is in the title. They came yeah. quite fast after each other yeah. as well. Perhaps yeah. some overlapping. So that's the kind of... That's where we are with this book. It isn't just, oh, here's Mrs. Hemingway's biography. Yes, it's, no, it's, it's a it, handful. Yeah, exactly. It's uh, told from the point of view of each Mrs. Hemingway. Uh, there were four. He was a cad. Um, and basically, it tells the story of each time uh, wife one meets mistress two, mistress two becomes wife two, meets mistress three. And, and there's this kind incredible of... incredible one-upmanship. Yeah, so I know. It's the, awful. And he's got quite a kind of proper wife and you think, well, obviously, this kind of super hot flapper. Yeah. yeah. Uh, No-brainer. <laughs> yeah. And I'm thinking, mm, but it says on the back of the book there's four. Yeah. <laughs> so, and then suddenly, yeah. Martha Gellhorn yeah. pops up. Yeah, I know. Like, mm. superhero woman. <laughs> yeah, I know. It was so brilliant to write her because... Um, you know, I think what's really hard about writing historical fiction is that you don't want to import all of the 21st century's ideas, yeah. sort of post-feminist ideas mm -hmm, about mm -hmm. womanhood, about how to, you know, um, be a wife in a marriage. And the first two feel very much pre that because they're willing to put up with so much. And then Martha Gellhorn comes along, <laughs> thank goodness, and saves the day. So, yeah, there's this kind of carousel of wives and mistresses and they turn each decade um, over the four decades that he's married. But And there's no... No, he spent zero days single between wives. Wow. Um, he was unwed for a period, but um, didn't actually <laughs> spend a day on his own, which makes me think, you know, that uh, uber-masculine man walking around shooting lions and uh, yeah, yeah. doing deep-sea fishing and doing all these things couldn't actually mm. bear to be alone in bed for one no. night. <laughs> Did any of the women become friends? Yes, um, Hadley and Fife or Pauline Pfeiffer uh, were friends in the beginning right. and then um, Pauline Pfeiffer became friends with the fourth wife uh, right. because as Mary said they were all part of the Hemingway University. Yes. Uh, it's so great that you see the, uh, the sort of shifting sands yeah, between yeah. them and you think Strange. well you know you're on page 30. Imagine if they'd all banded up against him, what yeah, I know. that would have been. I wish they had. Ernest, I feel now I'm I can call him Nesto. Nesto. <laughs> <laughs> he's this ahead. kind of source of fascination and he's he pops up in fiction, he's mm -hmm. popped up in films in a Woody Allen film recently. Mm -hmm. Like why do you think I mean the the key to this book is the women's relationships, but mm -hmm. it's still kind of pegged on this really mm -hmm. charismatic person. What and what what is it about I think, uh, can I say, first and foremost, he was absolutely gorgeous. Um, he was, you know, dream to look at, very, very charming uh, man. He had this great abundance of energy, which I think attracted people like Fitzgerald and mm -hmm. Ezra Pound, and it also attracted sort of legions of women. And he combined this amazing sort of alchemy of... Uh, being a sort of huge man's man, the boxing and the bullfighting and everything else, but also being a very sensitive soul who was trying to kind of create this new language uh, in his work. So 
for me, it's kind of obvious why you would be attracted to someone like that. And as he got older, he was, you know, very rich and he was a celebrity in his own right. So, you know, if he'd invited me to go and live in sure. Havana, I think <laughs> yeah. I would have said yes. And I'll put up with the mistresses as well. <laughs> Any present day writers you'd like to see the fictionalised treatment? Anybody you reckon will end up being? Oh, um, I don't know. Philip Roth, maybe? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think he'd be interesting uh, as sort of bio biopic yeah. of his life maybe and um, this isn't a leading question this is from Jax Blunt on Twitter and she would like to know it's quite a trick question what's the book you most regret reading oh um I don't know that I regret no meanness please uh, yeah no. I don't know how to answer that question without any meanness um I don't know that I regret reading any books I mean I suppose an interesting way of me thinking about it because I've been in such a Hemingway hole of research for the past three and a half years is that People think I'm a fan of absolutely everything mm -hmm. he's written, and there's certainly books that I just kind of um, can't bear. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, do you have any that you sort of like? Maybe even sort of. Oh, I, I regret reading it because it was so good. I couldn't put pen to paper for weeks. Do you know my favourite book um, is *A Fine Balance* by Rohinton mm -hmm. Mystery. I love that book, and. Yet, I hate it, mm -hmm. in that it is not an easy read, it's not a particularly pleasant read, but having said that, it's changed me as a result of reading it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it was worth the journey, but I, I read it years ago and I still think about it. And, and it, 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 was, it was a very brutal story, but it was worth knowing, it was worth going through, because, you know, not not all the best stories are happy, actually. Mm -hmm. Sure. Mm -hmm. Louise, do you have any that you kind of... I don't think I'd say I regret reading any book, because even if, if you don't necessarily like it, you, you maybe learn why you don't like it, mm -hmm. and you learn what works yeah. really well, and what moves you, and, and what you like, and what you want to read more of. I, I wouldn't say I've regretted any that I've read. Mm -hmm. And guys, do keep in touch with us. If you have any questions for any of our authors, you can get in touch via Twitter, and the details should be on your screen now. Now, Karen, um, your journey to writing was kind of, it was via fashion journalism, mm -hmm, so yes. you weren't sort of, get, didn't go through the creative writing course, no. sort of, but when you, no, tell us the truth, when you were doing your journalism, <laughs> were you sort of dreaming of novels, like why must you harness me with your word count, Genuinely. or did it sort of happen <laughs> organically? Yeah. All my life, all my teachers, <laughs> everyone who ever gets a thank you card from me, everyone said, you're going to be a writer. I would say, no, I'm not. I'm, I don't know why you're saying this to me. Why do you say this to me? And it, it, I don't know. I think I have quite a distinctive style of writing. And mm. for me, it was just normal, but it struck other people. And I... So people were reading your journalism and saying, yeah, this should grow. Exactly. And, yeah. But even if I wrote a thank you card for dinner, what? people would say, oh my God, your card. I was like, what? <laughs> yeah, thank you. And they were like, no, no, but I mean, you know. And I would think, oh, oh gosh. And it, I got quite annoyed with it actually because it was always the thing that people would say to me mm. and um, I, I ended up in it really by accident. I'd written a non-fiction book after my first child was born and my agent for that said, you must go into fiction. And I said, oh God, no. I said, I can't, I've never done any creative writing, I wouldn't know where to begin. And she said, just begin at the beginning, just sit mm. down and do it. And, and I did. I ended up with a spare afternoon free, and I had no idea what to do with myself. I had no money to go shopping. I couldn't, didn't know what to do. So I just hiked my laptop down to the local library, and I kept thinking I was going to get thrown out for plugging it in and using that <laughs> yeah, electricity. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I just didn't. And, um, and I wrote a scene. And as soon as I'd written that, I thought, Oh God! I've started a book. Now I'm going to have to finish it. Yeah, can't be one of those people. So are you, you're kind of an organic writer. So you start yeah. with a scene or an item yeah. or a sort of moment of inspiration and see where those characters. I go. did with that book, and actually, so you've got a big whiteboard now. You kind of like um, fully plotted. Uh, yes, I have Milskin notebooks that I always mm. twang the strap and you know use those for my Fascinating, notes. Isn't but it? as soon as I started to do it, I realised it was what I was supposed to do. Mm. It was like. The universe knew before I did. I was yeah. the last person to get invited to that party, you know. <laughs> um, and, and now I think, oh my God, you know, I've wasted all those years. Um, yeah. <laughs> I love it. I just love it. Yeah. So this kind of looped to what one of our viewer questions was, which was Helen Bennett, who wanted to know where, where does the inspiration come from for your novels? Do you kind of have to take yourself off and say, well, I'm going on an inspirational <laughs> trip somewhere very stunning. Yes, my spot. next book is being set in the Turks and Caicos. <laughs> um, or do you 
kind yeah. of have to go and sit in a dark room and with you know soundproof headphones on and just think or do, or do, or do you just it just happens. you get it from life you know you talk yeah. to someone and they tell you a great story or you read something or you hear a, a great lyric in a song you I'm, know I'm things like that got carried away do we have and can you tell us things about a new novel have you had your inspiration are you in the schedule what, what, uh, what? yes so the next book's coming out in may that's called the summer without you and it's <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, no. Next book's out for the summer. Oh, so, uh, wow. so yeah. So in my head, I'm thinking about all my winter readers. You know, when they're curled up in front of the fire, exhausted from Christmas. Now yeah. I'm thinking about them stretched out on a towel, needing oh. to, you know, regenerate. Um, so it's based in the Hamptons. The sun cream on the Kindle. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> now, Louise, you're our kind of only non-novelist. Mm. So, kind of, how did you structure this? Because you've got these two distinct parts with your book. You've yes. got the recipes, and then yes. you've got the family history. But you kind of you needed one to do the other, but mm. also the other to do the one. So, yes. how did you kind of get get, was, it, get it was, going? Like, turn it into a book rather than a kind of project. It, it evolved as I as I researched and wrote and baked, and the recipes are themed to each chapter as well. Yes. So, for example, so start I, with yeah, children. I start off with children. So my childhood memories about the tea shop, and then I recreate those childhood cake recipes. Yeah. So um, each each chapter has got that theme, and the structure evolved really. And I followed my parents' love story about how they met and had their wedding reception in the tea shop. Yeah, because you see, you sort of seem to have gone much further back into their history yes. than you maybe started out. You kind of like, oh, I just need to know how much flour in this one because exactly. Know, I'm doing a recipe book. And then it was suddenly this all unfolded. It did, it all unfolded. And then during the process of writing, you know, I discovered that the pastry chef ancestors in our family came from a place called Poschiavo on the Swiss-Italian border. Not and I had ago. to go, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> I know you've been to exotic places, but... <laughs> and on that on that journey, I had to look for cakes as well. Obviously, oh, sort of your job sucks. <laughs> ro <laughs> roaming around Poschiavo, looking for my ancestors and cakes, and yeah, um, that, that tough, actually yeah. That, that became about two chapters because it was one um, in search of the pastries, in search of <laughs> my ancestors, and then when I came back, um, my father recreated the coffee Japanese cake which he used to make in our tea shop which I found in a in a cafe in Poschiavo yeah, which so was really trust. incredible so we then made that cake together for my children so I got two children because I wanted to be able to pass the recipes on to my family as well yeah. and so it must have been quite kind of emotional like you were mm. you would you were obviously seeking solid hard facts and recipes for your readers <laughs> but kind of you can't not have kind of become sort of closer to your family as mm. a result of this yeah it was an emotional journey um in fact you know during during the writing of the book my father became ill as well and yeah. I, I noticed him sort of slowing down with the baking mm -hmm. but he was still still keen to, to sort of show me and teach me yeah. the recipes and um it was lovely seeing my children learn from their grandfather as well mm. and also hear the stories about the tea shop yeah well this is our this is your you're starting to answer with mm. <laughs> lisa stock from twitter oh, yeah. has asked what was the experience of revisiting your father's memories mm. like so did you kind of was was there, was there sort of a new angle that you got on him like I think what, was, kind of think, what was what oh, was really well, now I yeah. understand that a bit better i did actually what was interesting is i started off like a journalist but like you know both journalists and i turned up with my dictaphone and sat down in the dining room and tried to sort of get stories that way and then realized that wasn't his natural way of talking yeah so it's I'd not sort of, a room he no was it wasn't of, natural yeah. at all so then we'd start baking and he chatted and he told me things I don't think he would ever have told me if I'd been trying to formally find out those answers so he then told me about growing up in his parents tea shop yeah and then he also had memories of his grandparents tea shop my great-grandparents and just funny little stories would evolve about great uncle Charlie who had chocolate flowing through his veins <laughs> apparently this story goes in our family and yeah um, but now I've been I've indulged myself with all these questions about <laughs> how wonderful this book is because I've had a chance to look at it but when is it out it's out on March the 13th right. and then one month later the standalone ebook memoirs out as well which is a longer oh, version oh I see oh I didn't Ooh. know you were chopping it all up. <laughs> Thank you. Now then, he is a best-selling crime and thriller novelist whose books have been published in 36 languages. Peter James is famous for his detective superintendent Roy Grace novels.
which are based in his hometown and mine, Brighton, in East Sussex. But where does he get his ideas from, literally, and where does he do his writing? He is our first author over the series to give us a tour of his writer's room. I was very, very shy as, as a kid. I, mean, I was afraid of the dark. Uh, every bump in the night, I think, was a sort of mad axeman who's come and to murder me. And I used to live out my fantasy life by writing about it. Roy Grace is based quite a large extent on, on a real life former police officer, a guy called Dave Gaylor. And I met Dave the first time I was introduced to him about 15 years ago. Somebody said, you ought to meet this character. He's a homicide detective, quite interesting guy. And I went into his office at Brighton Police Station and it was a complete tip. Blue and green crates everywhere, bulging with folders. And I said, are you moving? And he gave me a very sardonic smile. And he said, no, these are my dead friends. He is my real life Roy Grace. And I think he has played an incalculable role in the authenticity that my books have and which I strive so hard to maintain. I'm not always the sharpest tack in the box. You know, I miss things quite often. So the, there's a huge amount of me in, in Roy and, and, and vice versa, I think. Six o'clock in the evening, I make a vodka martini with a ritual, either four olives or, or a lemon around the rim. Go in my office, sit down, fag, music, and get in the zone. And I'll write till half nine, ten o'clock. First thing every morning, by half past six, run three to five miles, have breakfast, and I go back to my study, and I'll read what I wrote the night before, and plan what I'm gonna write that evening. One of the really exciting things about writing, or for me, is that you never know where an idea is going to pop in your head from. It could, it could be after my second vodka martini. <laughs> but an awful lot of what I write about has come out of my research with, with the police. Don't cross me. I had a, there was a critic in a magazine who gave me a really nasty review a couple of years ago, and I actually had her um, dissect it on a post-mortem table. <laughs> so Peter James there with quite a sort of glamorous and specific <laughs> regime he has. I'm quite relieved. I didn't want it to be too grisly. Um, but Naomi, do you have a sort of a specific time of day or a routine or regime? Or... Um, I definitely like to write in the morning um, because I'm very fresh and I feel um, ready for the day. Um, yeah. If I write too late in the afternoon, I can kind of think, you know, the light's fading, you know, your energy is kind of a bit Why depleted, bother? and you just think, oh, this is a wretched business, what am, I, <laughs> what am I doing? Whereas if I just do, and I don't need too uh, many hours to write because I can spend the whole afternoon researching or something, so maybe 8 till 11, something like that. I can edit very happily for a long time, but writing into the blank a page. A bit of a burst mm. Yeah, thing. that has to, to be. To feel it's out of the exactly. way. And then you have a nice cup of coffee, you know, reward yourself with something uh, and get on with the rest of the day. But yeah, the mornings well, is good for me. This is yeah. what I'd, it's Louise's reward system I'm interested yeah. in. Yeah. <laughs> you Palmios. write in the morning? I, yeah, I'm an early bird. I, I always wake up early. And then what happens? It's like, oh, I've, I've been busy writing about this. I should probably just taste it again. <laughs> bake, bake, bake a cake. I must, re, yeah, must taste that again and, and check, check what it's like. And I don't always eat cakes every day, but <laughs> they help. They help a lot. I know there's a lot of anti-sugar at the moment, but uh, yeah. I definitely like a cup of tea and cake. And it's a treat, like you mm, say, if you have absolutely. actually written a thousand words, which is yeah. my aim, um, then it's nice to reward yourself, mm, isn't yes. it, girls? Because it's me, <laughs> it doesn't feel as bad. If I had a, yeah. a coffee and a biscuit, I'd think, yeah. mm. Coffee and cake, though, mm, I, I think Forgive that's okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, Karen, I, it's, it's your writing room that I want to know about. Your, you've, you, what is this? You've got a magical treehouse My situation. My treehouse. It, it is seasonal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's very much summertime. My um, children have a beautiful treehouse at the bottom of the garden. Oh, so it's there. I know. <laughs> Lego <laughs> everywhere. You've know, got tissue pumpkins above my head. head. <laughs> and yes, they're quite indignant if I do go down there. I usually edit down there, actually, because um, my laptop is really old, and, but I've got a bit of a superstition about it. So mm. I've got lots of others that I just don't use, which yeah. drives my husband mad. And my, my poor knackered old la laptop's got about 20 minutes battery. <laughs> so I have to be near a power supply, which I don't have in the treehouse. Okay. Um, so I tend to go down there to edit. Um, there's a big, the platform is built in the trees. Yeah. So I have these huge garden cushions and I lie on those and <gasps> got wisteria. I mean, it's it's almost like Romeo and Juliet. And you, you take your power. laptop up 
there. I do, and I just... Uh, do you have a uh, perilous if you're I do, the and there's a root bridge. I mean, it's, it's a bit <laughs> Indiana Jones, to be honest. I mean, and the dogs can't follow me because their paws would get broken, you know, on the root bridge. So they're, <laughs> they're kind of whining from the other platform, and I'm like, I'm sorry, I have to work. You know? <laughs> oh. <laughs> right, well, we've learned a bit more about you three, but still to come on the show, author Lucy Diamond will face our quick-fire question test, and we'll hear more from our guests. But first, what are the hottest titles we should be looking out for in 2014? It's February and there are lots of new and soon to be published books to look forward to for the rest of the year. But which ones do you choose and why? Crime, history, romance? Well, fear not because members of the Pan Macmillan staff have stepped into the breach to guide you with their picks of the books to look out for in 2014. This is my pick of 2014. It's Unwrap Sky by Rourke Davison. Um, it's a wonderfully written fantasy novel um, and it has a pretty cool undersea city and some minotaurs. My pick for 2014 is Claire Donoghue's Never Look Back. It's a South London set book. It's thrilling and terrifying. Uh, the book I'm most excited about this year is Night School by Richard Wiseman. Uh, it's based on new science and it's going to finally teach me how to get a good night's sleep, which is excellent. The book I'm the most excited about this year is The Miniaturist by Jessie Burton. It's a debut. It's set in Amsterdam in the 1600s and the city was full of riches and um, so it's really decadent and beautiful. Um, it's slightly spooky, it's a little bit off-centre and it makes you feel like the characters are completely alive today. It's absolutely brilliant. The book I'm most excited to read in 2014 is Jane Green's Saving Grace. I think it's going to be her funniest and most romantic novel to date. The book I'm most looking forward to in 2014 is Tanya Byron's The Skeleton Cupboard. The book I'm most excited about is Helen Oyemi's Boy Snowbird. Helen is a phenomenal talent and to my mind one of our most exciting contemporary writers. Uh, what I love about this book is her magical brand of storytelling, its mischief, its charm. Uh, it's a book about mothers and daughters, about how families are formed and about the sidesteps and dances that people make around each other to work out their own relationships. The book I'm most excited about in 2014 is The Flying Bath by Julia Donaldson and illustrated by David Roberts. I'm really excited to see a new David Roberts illustrated book because his illustrations are gorgeous. Okay, so the book I'm most excited about is Chris O'Dowd's Moon Boy. Um, you might have seen the TV series, which I love, and I love Chris O'Dowd as well. I think it's going to be really funny. It's about a small boy and his imaginary friend in Ireland, and it's just, it's really fun and enlightening. Uh, the book that I'm most looking forward to in 2014 is The Axe Man's Jazz by Ray Celestin. Uh, it's set in 1919 New Orleans. Um, there's a serial killer running around the city and he says if you don't play jazz in all of the bars, someone's going to get killed. Uh, and Louis Armstrong's a character in it as well and it's just brilliant. It's adventurous and exciting, um, really fun and quite scary. Uh, and this is my recommendation. That's a right old literary smorgasbord <laughs> there. So, <laughs> any particular ones taking your fancy, Louise? I'm <clears throat> really looking forward to Tanya Barron's The Skeleton Cupboard later this year. I, I find her very authentic and compelling anyway as, mm. a, as in the work that she does. And um, the book will be following her training as a mental health practitioner and covering some of the case studies. Um, mm. So I think it'd be really interesting to get an insight into what it was like training and about these interesting case studies as well. Yeah. Mm. And were there any that weren't on the list that anyone else has sort of got their eye on for later in the year? I'm looking forward to Edward St. Aubyn's uh, new book because I absolutely loved um, the Patrick Melrose novels. Mm -hmm. so they're there completely brutal and difficult to read a bit like uh, yeah. what we were talking about before um, I can't remember the title <laughs> uh, but I'm very much looking forward to it yeah. and Karen any um, well actually off that list I really like the, um, the sound of the miniaturist mm. um, it's such a great uh, title really, it's beautiful mm. and so the the colors envy, gorgeous and yeah yeah I love um, Dutch Dutch literature or literature that's based in in Amsterdam um, I uh, I loved Tulip Fever, I loved uh, The Girl with the yeah. Pearl Earring, mm. all of that. So it yeah. sounds to me like it's onto a winner. <laughs> <laughs> sounds really good. <laughs> now then, this month it was Lucy Diamond, author of Me and Mr Jones, who gives us her answers to our quick fire questions. I think maybe 
Jane Eyre is brilliant. Uh, I've read it lots of times. Every time I read it, there's always something new that I, that I take from it. Um, I think by a pool in the Mediterranean with the sun shining, crickets, glass of wine, that'll do me. Oh, I'm reading Longbourn at the moment by Joe Baker, which is this upstairs, downstairs version of Pride and Prejudice. So it's all from the servant's point of view. It's fantastic. Jojo Boys, it's not out yet, uh, it's out in a few days I think. I loved all the Innie Blyton books, Famous Five, um, Secret Seven, Five Point Outers, brilliant. Uh, not really, <laughs> sorry. I love, there's a few ones I really love, uh, Lisa Jewell, everything by her I want to read. Um, Jojo Boys is great, Maggie O'Farrell, oh and Kate Atkinson is brilliant. Thank you to Lucy there. She seemed very relaxed. Yeah. <laughs> um, were there? Can I put you on the put you on the spot? Were there any kind of all time favourite authors for you guys? Uh, I don't know. In terms of, I love the classics, so I'm a big fan of um, Thomas Hardy when he's not being too <laughs> miserable. <laughs> yeah, I know <laughs> it's a little depressing, but it's good for a winter's day like we have now. Yeah. Um, in terms of contemporary authors, uh, I love John Banville. I think mm -hmm. he's. Uh, He's a real winner. I love that sort of lyrical maximalist prose. I think he's, uh, I always admire the way he writes when I read his books. And Louise? I really enjoyed Nigel Slater's book Toast mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. the way oh, it book. connects food yeah, with, emo yeah. with emotions. Sort of and that really struck a chord with me. Yeah. Um, I also love Jan Harris's novel Chocolat as well. Once again, foodie themed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And Karen, do you only read Christmassy novels? <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> um, gosh, all-time favourite author, I would say John Irving, uh, the American writer, um, particularly his early stuff. I think um, there's a difference between able to write well and being able to tell a story. Mm -hmm. And I think he's genuinely uh, one of the best storytellers around. He creates such vivid, bizarre worlds. Mm -hmm. I just, yeah. I love going there. Mm -hmm. I love it. Now, Lucy was filmed there um, at the Pam Macmillan Author Fiction Party, which was last week. Now, we, you, you the, our fiction writers were there last night as well. Mm. Did you have fun? Was it nice to kind of get out of your writing clothes and see some <laughs> other people in real life? <laughs> It's so gorgeous because, you know, when you're a writer, you're, you're stuck in your office on your own. You know, it's just you and yeah. your screen and your notebook or your post-its, whatever. And it's just heavenly, actually, once a year to all get together and drink champagne and talk books and talk covers and release, you know, your new release and press and whatever it is in your new book. And, yeah. you know, you just talk shop and then you talk about everything else as well. But it's, it's lovely, you know. Yeah, uh, it's, I yeah. agree. I mean, meeting the authors, I think, is just incredible yeah. because you can have such a chin wag about... And people are very honest as well. Yeah. Like, God, isn't it hard sometimes? Know. You know, and then people are very candid about, um, you know, all different aspects of the craft. Mm. And do you like your cover? And you know, yes. how, when do you write? And God, I haven't written anything in months. Yeah. You, know? yes. you need to see other authors to sort of realise that it's Is not it just, just crazy. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Everyone's exactly. talking a lot about. Um, the, the bar of shame um, on a, the news web, certain news websites. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and, and when you've got and to tweeting. the bottom, you yes. know it's time to start There's writing. A lot of work displacement yeah. activities, yeah. and everyone really Shows does it. Them, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's a life everyone must dream of. <laughs> <laughs> now then, if it really is a life that you dream of, we are launching our own literary version of The Voice. Each month, we will be asking unpublished authors to pitch their latest work in 20 seconds by sending in a short video of themselves, and then we'll ask our guest authors to give their thoughts and choose their favourites on the show. Mm. All you need to do is to contact us via email on the box on your screen or Twitter at Pam Macmillan or the hashtag BookBreak and tell us your name and a little bit about your unpublished novel. Leave us contact details and we'll be in touch if we'd like to feature you on the show. Now, we're nearly out of time. <laughs> My thanks to Naomi Wood, Karen Swan and Louise John Cox for joining us on our very first episode of Book Break. If you want to get in touch with the programme, you can contact us on Twitter with any book-related questions. If you want to find out about any of the books that Pan Macmillan publish, you can go to their website, which is panmacmillan.com. And if you want to re-watch any part of the show, an on-demand version will be available shortly.
Make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel and don't forget about the competition. We are back next month, so we'll see you then. Goodbye. Thank you.